Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Clean Machine Live. My name is Jeff Palmer and the CEO and founder of Clean Machine, plant-based fitness nutrition. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, plant-based fitness nutrition, nutrition kind of overall and what you may be missing by eating only plants. Let's do some myth busting today. Uh, I'm going to go down a list of some of my favorite myth busters. <laughs> uh, people have commented, uh, you know, you say uh, uh, people who comment on social media posts, whether on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, or Facebook, that you can't get X, fill in the thing, by eating a plant-based or vegan diet. When I say vegan diet, meaning that a diet of a vegan there is no such thing as a vegan diet. Vegan is an ethic and a lifestyle, but we do subscribe to a specific diet. So that's what I'm referring to. More commonly referred to as a plant-based diet and more accurately <laughs> referred to as a plant exclusive diet. Big difference. Plant-based can include meats and dairy and eggs and other such, uh, but is mostly plant-based by definition, mostly from plants, whereas a plant-exclusive diet is more like what I eat as a vegan, which is only foods coming from plants. That includes no honey, eggs, meat, dairy, poultry, fish, or anything else that is made by <laughs> or created by an animal. Okay, so no mo FOMO. No more fear of missing out. That's FOMO, fear of missing out. A lot of people think their fear of missing out, like, I can't gain muscle if I go on a plant-based diet. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I am a natural bodybuilding champion, natural physique champion. So I have beat everybody on stage, even at my ripe old age of 57 years old, 59 now, I won at 57, and, um, and still packing on the muscle at my age, at, in my 60th year of life. So no excuses there, but let's run down the list. I'm gonna do this rapid fire, so we're gonna go over the list. But before I get started, the disclaimer, uh, this video is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. All right, so let's go down number one. Number one obviously has to be the top one, which is where do you get your protein, right? Well, most of you already know where we get our protein. All protein in its essential amino acid form is made by plants. There are some bacteria that can create their, some microbes that can actually create their own uh, and synthesize their own essential amino acids. And um, we do get actually some amino acids from broken down cells um, or broken down microorganisms in our gut. So some of the protein does come from that, but the vast majority of the protein we eat all originates in plants. So plants are the only ones that can actually make them, besides microbes, as we discussed earlier, make the essential amino acids that make up all of the proteins in our body. Now, herbivores like us only have nine essential amino acids. Those nine essential amino acids are all created by plants. Carnivores, on the other hand, actually have one other amino acid that they require for their living, and that's taurine. Taurine is not made by plants. That's why they're called carnivores, because they have to get that amino acid by consuming another animal that makes taurine. Hey, guess who makes taurine? Herbivores make taurine inside their own body. Guess what humans are? Herbivores. Yes, we make our own taurine. Carnivores cannot make taurine. They have to eat it by eating another animal because plants don't make taurine either. Only herbivorous animals make taurine, just like humans. That's right, we're herbivores. That's one indicator that shows us human beings are herbivores, not carnivores. Carnivores require taurine. Human beings and all other herbivores do not because we make our own taurine. That was one of the ones on the list too, but that's just to show you animal proteins aren't necessary for humans at all. Incomplete proteins. Oh dear God, that's the one I get more, more, more often than animal proteins. The myth that plants are incomplete in their proteins. <clears throat> Wrong. Okay, so where did that misconception come from? It came from the fact that um, 
the amino acid profile of, of animals is higher in certain amino acids and lower in plant ones. We used to think, obviously, more is better, right? Amino acids. We need amino acids to make proteins. If you get more of them from the food, that's better. Ding! <clears throat> Wrong again. Actually, higher amounts of methionine and cysteine, the two sulfur-bound amino acids, those are actually worse for us. Methionine actually feeds cancer cells and can cause cancer growth and metastasization. That's right. Those higher methionine and cysteine, cysteine can turn to homocysteine, cause heart attacks, stroke, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, high blood pressure. That's right. So those animal proteins that are higher in those two amino acids are actually worse than the ones that are lower in those amino acids. So this higher is better is just wrong, wrong. <laughs> it is not better. It is actually worse for us and could potentially cause some of the biggest disease killers of, of Americans. And that's because we are eating too many animal proteins, animal proteins for breakfast, animal proteins for lunch, animal proteins for dinner. And we're getting too much of this, these two amino acids in our system and it's causing problems for us. So let's go on to the next one. Essential fatty acids. Most people think essential fatty acids, the two, when I say, hey, what are the two essential fatty acids? Almost everybody says, oh, EPA and DHA. <clears throat> I'm sorry, that's wrong. EPA and DHA are not even essential because our body makes its own. The only essential omega-3, and there's only one of them, is ALA. And this comes from plants. It's made by plants. Um, actually, carnivores, and this is another reason why human beings are not carnivores, we're herbivores, is uh, herbivores take ALA, convert it to SDA, then ETA, then EPA, then DPA, then DHA. That's six forms of omega that our body uses as an herbivore. In a animal diet, they don't create, they don't have that first three steps. They don't use ALA, they don't use SDA, they don't use ETA. They only eat other animals, which get them give them the source of their EPA, DPA, and DHA. So they only have three uh, forms of omega-3, whereas human beings on this side, the herbivore side, we have all six forms of omega-3s that we need for brain function, heart health, all the cellular structure health. We use them all. That's why our body only requires one, the one at the very top, because it's a unidirectional conversion, ALA, all the way down through all six forms of omega-3. And our body can create those through enzymes and through epigenetics. So that is another indicator that, that animals only require the bottom three, whereas uh, humans and other herbivores actually require all six forms of those omega-3s and utilize them for functions. B12, now this is a funny one because animals don't make B12. So you're just saying, oh, you can get it from meat. Well, yeah, but the meat, the animal, actually got it from bacteria. Animals don't make B12. That's a fallacy. Uh, B, all B12 is made by bacteria. So there's bacteria in the soil. There's bacteria in the water. There's bacteria on the surface of fruits and vegetables that we would eat. Unfortunately, we purified the water so that it's safe to drink because we've got bad bacteria in there too as well. Wipe out the bad bacteria, take out the good bacteria with it too as well, the ones that are producing the B12. Same with the surface of the fruits. We wash all the fruits and vegetables. And that's probably a good thing in this day and age. Get those contaminants off. Also get any dangerous bacteria off. So we did this to promote our own health. But what we did is wiped out all the B12 in naturally occurring places. So now, yes, it's better to take a B12 supplement. And that's a good idea for almost everyone because about 20% of the population of the United States is deficient in B12. So wait a minute. Only about 1% to 3% are vegans, yet 20% of people in the U.S. are deficient in B12. That means about 19% of those people uh, are actually uh, non-vegetarians that are deficient in, 12, in B12 compared to if everybody was deficient in B12. All right. And that's 
from modernization of our food and water supply. It has nothing to do with B12s not found in plants. As a matter of fact, I was the very first person out there to talk about B12 in a plant. That's right. There is certain plants that actually take those B12 and pull those bacteria right up into their root systems, whether they're in the ground or in the case of clean green protein with lentine. The lentine plant actually floats along the water and soaks up those B12. They live in little nodules inside the root systems, and you can actually get B12 from that. 20% of your B12 naturally occurring inside of the plant. So this idea that you can't get B12 from plants is no longer true. Hormone D3, and I say hormone D3 because that's what it is. It is not a vitamin. D3 is not a vitamin. It's a hormone produced by yeah, the human body. We produce it. So hormone D3 is produced when we have direct sunlight on our body for sufficient amounts of time. If that sunlight is not in a curvature of the earth <laughs> or that is required enough because of the pigmentation of our skin. Check out my D3 video from Clean Machine Live on that for more information on why D3 is a very important supplement. Up to 90% of people can be D3 deficient. Very important, I think, for most people to be taking D3 because we live in northern climates. We're carrying heavier body fat. D3 is, is fat soluble, so it gets soaked up and not being able to be made bioavailable. You can have darker skin. If you're Hispanic or black, you'll probably need to take higher amounts of vitamin D3 if you're not exposed to the sun and if you live in northern uh, climates. Northern climates, especially during cold weather, because that's when the axis of the earth is tilted, the sunlight reflects off the surface of our atmosphere and doesn't penetrate enough to trigger D3 production in humans. All right, next one, heme iron. Oh, God. I was on the Instagram. Uh, no, I was on the LinkedIn. And uh, somebody said, oh, we need this uh, red meat because it's rich in heme iron. That much is true. It is rich in heme iron. But heme iron actually is known to be a carcinogenic or carcinogenic forming. When you consume heme iron, it is free iron. That is a metal that can oxidize. Once it starts to oxidize, it can form nitrosamines. Nitrosamines are highly carcinogenic. That means cancer causing. So heme iron is a dangerous item and it's known to be related not only to cancer, heart attacks, stroke, even diabetes. So heme iron is a not good thing. And then they say, oh, wait a minute, but plant-based iron is bound to phytates, phytic acid. Check out my one called pumping iron. You'll find out more why that phytic acid can not only separate from the plant and then be free phytate, phytic acid or IB6 can go over and kill the cancer cells that are formed by that awful heme iron that is found in animal products. So you don't want heme iron. That is the worst thing you can do for yourself as far as that is concerned. Now, if you are iron deficient, you definitely want to consider taking supplement, but see your doctor because there's health risks with taking supplements and not getting sufficient amounts. Definitely check with your physician on that one. So let's jump right into carnosine. I don't know if any of you heard of carnosine. Carnosine is considered one of these anti-aging molecules, right? Protects cells, it's a super antioxidant, does some wonderful things in the body, and its precursor beta alanine is used in sports supplements because it can help with recovery and energy production and um, detoxification of the body. Lots of good stuff. So what is carnosine? Carnosine is a um, amino acid dipeptide of histidine and beta alanine stuck together. That's why it's called a di, two peptides stuck together. And that's what makes it form. So it's amino acids and both beta alanine and histine can be made by plants. So although human beings, just like other herbivores, Herbivores take these two amino acids and form carnosine naturally produced in the liver of the human body. You don't need it from your diet. Creatine. Creatine is another amino acid made by the human body. So yes, you can get it by eating animals, but why not just be the animal <laughs> itself? That's right. It's funny. All of these things, carnosine, creatine, taurine, they're all made by herbivorous animals. We don't need to get them from our diet because we make our own. Really cool stuff. 
All right, so creatine, we make about one gram a day. Now, I take creatine as a supplement because it's shown that you, when you take up to five grams or more of creatine per day, you can increase strength and increase muscle size too and endurance. Great supplement, very safe, no health risks, no known health risk for creatine and lots of additional health uh, benefits too, like possibly increasing um, IQ and uh, cognitive function as well as heart function. Taurine. Well, we talked about taurine just a little while ago. Taurine is not made by plants, but good thing we don't need to get it from plants because our body can make its own taurine, just like every herbivorous animal can. Now, animals that uh, are carnivorous do not and cannot make taurine and plants don't make it either. So the only way they can get taurine is by eating another animal that does make taurine like humans do. <laughs> okay, vitamin K2. This is another one. And unfortunately, I see even other plant-based folks uh, saying that you have to take vitamin K2 as a supplement. Now, if you get yourself tested, blood tests will do, but if you get yourself tested and you are low on vitamin K, definitely either one, change your diet so that you're make, making sure you're getting sufficient amounts of it, or two, supplement. But if you look at the supplements of vitamin K2, what are they made and how are they made? They are made like natto. Natto is a fermented soy, really foul tasting and smelling. I don't know if you guys have ever tried natto. It's a Japanese delicacy. I think it's pretty acquired taste. If you ask me, it's stinky, it's smelly, and it's weird tasting. But some people grow to really like it. Now, natto is a fermentation of soy. Well, what is our fermentation tank down here? That's right, our digestive tract actually makes K2. That's how it's made in the laboratory. Those K2 supplements are made by taking the bacteria that similarly live in our gut, that take vitamin K1 from soy and convert it into vitamin K2, and that's gut bacteria that do that. The problem here lies with people with K2 deficiency is not that they should be eating animals instead, is that they're not eating enough plants and fiber to feed their gut bacteria, to make that gut bacteria healthy enough and have enough of these uh, K2 producing uh, bacteria and the gut to convert K1 to K2. An interesting study, they did a study on all nurses and found that when they took antibiotics, antibiotics are known to knock out a lot of our good, healthy bacteria in our gut, that their K2 levels dropped by 66% within a week. I mean, that's horrible. But that's what happens when you're not supporting good gut health by consuming prebiotic fibers, especially high fibers. That's what K2 does. K2, if you have a healthy gut by eating lots of plants, eating lots of prebiotic fibers from plants like beans and grains and greens, then you're gonna, you're gonna have a healthy enough gut to convert that vitamin K2 one, which is bountiful in plants. If you look at dark greens, super high, probably over a thousand percent kale, <laughs> lentine. Lentine has 1,100% of the vitamin K1 plus the prebiotic fiber that feeds all that gut bacteria and converts it. I've got a great CM Live on K2, why you probably don't need to, to be consuming it and why as a vegan, if you're eating whole food plant-based, you are probably getting way more K2 than those folks out there consuming an animal-based diet. So K2 made by our gut, if you are feeding your gut plants and, and uh, sources, healthy sources of vitamin K1, which is bountiful in a plant-based, whole food plant-based diet. Zinc. So the sources of zinc include beans, chickpeas, lentils, tofu, walnuts, cashews, chia, flax, hemp, pumpkin seeds, whole grain bread, quinoa. That sounds like my daily diet. <laughs> like, you know, if you're really concerned about zinc, get your levels tested get those blood levels tested, track your diet, go out there and use like uh, MyFitnessPal or Chronometer, track your diet, look at the nutrition on there, or go out and get blood tested and see where you're at, then change your diet and track it and make sure that you're getting it. 
make sure you're getting enough of these foods that are high in these nutrients. Remember my three tenants, uh, which is um, intensity in your workouts, nutrient density in your food intake, and consistency. Stay with it on a regular basis. So when you're consuming food, look for those superfoods like my uh, good friend Ivan does. He superfoods out almost every meal and he's getting maximal amount of nutrition so that the body not only can just maintain its health, but can work at an optimal level. And he's getting optimal results in his, in his fitness as well. All right, let's move on to iron. Iron is really high in dark greens, grains, peas, things like this. Look, listen, this should not be an issue for folks eating a plant-based diet. Just one scoop of clean green protein, which is the whole food lentine. It's complete whole greens in it. Provides 75% of all the iron my body needs for an entire day. And just one scoop. So this should be really easy if you're eating dark greens and beans and grains on a regular basis in their whole food state. Yes, some of it is bound, but when you check out my CM Live, my Clean Machine Live on uh, iron, and you, I think, will understand why iron has been misdiagnosed. Just recently, last year, the... Um, Oxford Nutrition Data came out and said, we had the iron all wrong. And now we know that we are actually uh, recommending way too much iron. Uh, I did a whole thing on hepcidin, what hepcidin is, why the body produces hepcidin, why it blocks iron, why it does this for our safety, lots more on heme iron and why we shouldn't be doing uh, heme iron. But that should tell you a little bit about uh, why plant iron is actually so much better than heme iron or animal iron, and you shouldn't be worried about it on a healthy whole food plant-based diet. If you need to, though, definitely supplement because anemia is not something to play around with. If you do feel exhausted or tired all the time, talk to your doctor and get those levels back into healthy levels. All right, so iodine. So iodine has been depleted from our soil and that if it's not in the soil, the plants can't uptake the iodine. So much of our food is uh, iron is iodine depleted. Um, and that is from bad modern farming practices. Normally there would be a decent and healthy amount of recycling into the soil from other plants that would uh, nutrify with uh, iodine. That has been depleted by modern farming practices. That is a result of modernization of human beings and our food production. Um, you can get good sources of, iron, of uh, iodine from greens, but it may not be enough. Uh, sea vegetables, you have to be careful with because they can produce a good amount of iodine sufficient but you have to be very careful not to get too much iodine because it can actually have a negative effect on it too. So you have to be very careful with iodine. And for that reason, I actually supplement iodine to make sure I'm getting the proper amount every day. Iodine is really important for thyroid function, healthy thyroid function, uh, governs our metabolism. And right now with obesity at 66% in the United States, we need healthy thyroid functioning to make sure that we're making our metabolism work at its optimal state so that we're not gaining weight. This can help you uh, stay lemon uh, trim and lean, not lim <laughs> lemon trim, uh, trim and lean too. So iodine is very important for lots of different health processes in our body. We only need a small amount, but it's very important to get that right amount. That's why I supplement. Uh, calcium. Calcium is found in tofu, tempeh, dried figs, almonds, tahini, broccoli, chickpeas. Calcium is everywhere in the plant-based diet. Of course, plant-based uh, soaks up the calcium and stuff like this. And one of the highest animal sources of calcium comes from where? Cows, right? They produce it in the milk. Well, what's a cow eating all day long? Grass. Well, that's where the calcium they're getting is coming from. The dark greens grass. That's what they're eating. That's where they're getting all their calcium. And that's where humans can get their calcium too. Make sure you're getting lots of dark greens in there. Make sure you're cooking your dark greens, especially with things like spinach. 
um, uh, even lightly steaming them will, will help uh, release more of that calcium, make it more bioavailable. Magnesium, 50% of the population in the United States has been reported by certain studies to be deficient in magnesium. That is one of the other supplements that I take. Uh, I take it to supplement the magnesium that I'm already getting in there, but since it's fluctuating and I can't get all my dark greens in every single day, especially if I'm traveling or I'm at an event or doing, you know, marathon meeting for a clean machine to come up with our next coolest product. Yes, I want to make sure I'm getting my magnesium in because it's so important. Magnesium and calcium are contraction and relaxation of the muscle. Uh, calcium for contraction of the muscle, magnesium for relaxation of the muscle. So when you're working out on a regular basis, you definitely want to make sure that you're getting sufficient calcium, magnesium, and some of the other minerals that work together to help the muscles function properly. Choline. Okay, so let's talk about these two together, choline and carnitine. Both choline and carnitine do something really good in the body. One, they can help with brain and heart function. Carnitine more for the heart, choline more for the brain. Actually, acetylcholine makes up a lot of our brain processing. That is the number one neurotransmitter in our brain. Um, Choline can take a whole bunch of different forms. Acetylcholine is just one of the forms uh, with acetyl molecule stuck to it that our brain uses for neurotransmission. But choline can be used for lots of different forms. Phosphatidylcholine also used for helpful for brain function and cognition. Um, great supplement if you're ever really stressed out and your brain using your brain heavily, like for a workplace. That's a very interesting supplement. Although phosphatidylcholine and choline can be found in tofu. The most common source of choline is in eggs. A big difference though, between the choline found in plants and the choline and carnitine that comes from animals is that when the animal source choline and carnitine get into our gut, it can form trimethylamine, uh, um, TMA. I'll screw <laughs> the heck with a long name, TMA. TMA and then can then oxidize in the liver and become TMAO, which is associated with disease state after disease state from heart attacks to uh, just type in TMAO. And you can see the direct correlation of high levels of TMAO with disease states over and over and over again. Is it causal? Not yet defined yet, but the studies have shown a strong correlation between higher amounts of TMAO and higher levels of disease states from diabetes to heart attacks to stroke, um, right down the board, just really nasty chemical. And check it out, TMA and then TMAO. Both are caused by only animal produced choline and carnitine. When choline and carnitine is in its plant-based state and you're eating plant exclusive diet, that does not convert to TMA or TMAO at the levels that it does in animals. And when it does, the body actually destroys it and breaks it up because of that healthy microbiome can chew up that and, and keep it uh, safe from you. So here is a whole list of different nutrients that people think is better in animals when just the opposite is true. Now, why do I say all this? Because I want you to have the best sources to arm yourselves with the information that will give you a better understanding so you don't think you're missing out on anything, that you don't think that nutritionally there's something wrong or missing with a plant-based diet. Look, I've been vegan for 37 years, and this is the result. I'm in some of the best shape of my life in my 60th year of life. There's no reason, no reason you should fear a plant-based diet it's all there. All the nutrition is there. There are none of these carnosine, creatine, taurine, vitamin K, choline, carnitine, all made inside the human body. Um, EPA, DHA, made in the human body. You do not need these from animal sources. There is zero, zero requirement to get any form of nutrient from an animal, none by humans. There is not one single nutrient that our body needs for health, optimal health, and longevity. None. <laughs> all right. Now, if I've made that perfectly clear, then the big reason is all of these different 
plant nutrients then can help our body. When we take these animal nutrients out there that are out of our body, that are harming our body, causing cancer, heart attack, stroke, diabetes, high blood pressure, all these disease states. And if you do not understand the causal relationship, Dr. Greger's got a number one best-selling book, uh, How Not to Die. And he breaks it all down for you. I won't go into that, but I just want the best for you, the best in health, the best in nutrition. And I want you to not fear doing a plant-based diet. That's why I do what I do. It's why I, I um, bring on board uh, some of the top vegan athletes uh, out there showing you what is possible without the use of drugs and without the use of any animal products whatsoever. There's so many superstars out there now really accomplishing the best of their best doing it on a plant exclusive diet. You can too. And I want to break these fears, bust up these myths and get you going in the right direction so you can live a long, prosperous, healthy, enjoyable life. Thanks for joining me. And I hope this solves some of your questions. I'm going to get to the comments here in a second. Oh, what are the six? Uh, okay, Raymond says, what are the six omega-3s again? So it starts out with ALA, then it goes to SDA, then ETA, then EPA, then DPA, and then DHA. So it's a unidirectional conversion, and it all starts with the top one, which is ALA from plants. You can get ALA from ahi flower, one of the richest sources of omega-3 and 6 out there. So let's talk omega-6 for just a second then, since we brought that up. And omega-6 has different forms too. It goes from omega-6 LA. This is anti-inflammatory. A lot of people think omega-6, oh, it's pro-inflammatory. Actually, it's not. Not in its plant-based state. Uh, and then it goes to uh, GLA and then DGLA. Okay, These two are actually really strongly anti-inflammatory. And ahi flower has both ALA, SDA, both anti-inflammatory in omega-3s, and in omega-6s, it has LA and GLA, both anti-inflammatory. So four different omega-3 and omega-6 forms that are anti-inflammatory. Yes, omega-6 anti-inflammatory. You're not right. The plant forms of omega-6 are LA, anti-inflammatory, and GLA, anti-inflammatory. That's what's found in plants. Now, our body can convert GLA into the fourth, third or fourth, depending on how you look at it, uh, form, which is arachidonic acid. This is the omega-6 that becomes pro-inflammatory. When you work out, our body stores omega-6 in, in the muscle tissue. And when you work out, it squeezes out arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is a cell signal. It's pro-inflammatory saying, hey, wait, we're inflaming. We're stressing this area. Let's bring some molecules over here to heal it, to repair it, and then bring over some other forms of either omega-3 or omega-6 to bring down the inflammation. But this pro-inflammation response is a healthy response. What you don't want is when you eat animal products. The animal converts that omega-6 into arachidonic acid. That is the pro-inflammatory. Now, all those meat products, whether it's beef or chicken or poultry or turkey or whatever, have arachidonic acid in them. That is the pro-inflammatory version of it, not the plant-based LA or GLA. These are anti-inflammatory omega-6s. What you don't want is that arachidonic acid. Now, our body has a regulatory system that will turn that LA and to, to GLA and to DGLA and then into arachidonic acid, but it won't produce the enzyme to convert that GLA down to the pro-inflammatory arachidonic acid unless it has a need to. If you do something like injure yourself, then it needs to send some pro-inflammation over there to create inflammation, to speed the healing process. That's a good form of inflammation. What you don't want is consuming all these animal products that are loaded with this arachidonic acid form that our body isn't creating. Our body says, wait a minute, how did that arachidonic acid in here? I didn't convert it from DGLA. 
you're just dumping that into the, in the system. And that's when you can get all this pro-inflammation caused by consuming animal products. These animal forms of omega-6 are pro-inflammatory. It's not the plant forms that are pro-inflammatory. Obviously, if you get too much, that's not a good thing either. So eating a bunch of plant-based oils is not a great idea. And I would never suggest that. But eating them in their whole food plant-based days allows our body to do the regulating, to convert a, uh, LA and DGLA into omega-6 arachidonic acid only when our body needs it, when it requires proper inflammation. What you do when you eat the animal product is the animals already converted that to arachidonic acid and you're consuming it. Our body has no way of changing that except to try to downregulate and break down that arachidonic acid. So you're just instantly causing a bunch of inflammation every time you eat animal products with, which have this pro-inflammatory arachidonic acid. So it's, it's not the big concern. I hear this all the time. Oh, plants are loaded with omega-6 and that's bad because it's pro-inflammatory. No, the omega-6s that are found in plants are actually anti-inflammatory. It's not until our body converts them to a pro-inflammatory arachidonic acid. But when you eat animal products, you're getting pure pro-inflammatory arachidonic acid. <laughs> that's it. There you go. If you, and that's the way it should be. So this conversation should be switched just around. That you should be getting your, your omega-6 from the only omega-6 that is required, which is LA, the one at the top. Arachidonic acid is not an essential fatty acid. LA, the anti-inflammatory one from plants, that's the essential one. Our body requires that. We cannot live without it. It is essential for life. Big difference between omega-6 and plants and the omega-6 or arachidonic acid that wrecks your body with pro-inflammation, that's found in animals. Big difference. All this bull cocky about you know, plants being too high in omega-6, and it's it's not, it's the form of omega-6 that you should be concerned about. Our body has a way of regulating these through epigenetics, turning on and off a gene that produces the enzyme that does the conversion. Our body won't turn that gene on until we need that particular form of omega-6 converted down to arachidonic acid. There's a big difference between the way plants are. Our body requires precursors, and then our body regulates those different forms. Like from ALA omega-3, it turns it into SDA when our body needs it for our brain. It turns it down to ETA when our body needs it for our brain. It turns it down to EPA when our body needs it for blood pressure or, or heart function. It turns it down to DPA when it needs it for specific functions in the body. And then it turns it down to DHA when it needs it for brain health. Now the big question was, okay, but ALA doesn't it convert very little down to, to DHA? Well, that's true in the bloodstream, <laughs> but I explain all of this and why that whole fear that ALA doesn't convert to DHA is a total myth and total inaccurate because they weren't looking inside the tissues. They were just drawing blood. Your body would not take ALA and convert it all the way down to DHA if it can't convert it back. It's unidirectional, it only goes one way. It's like taking your dollar bills and converting them all down to pennies. Well, if you don't need pennies, why would you do that? That's just stupid. Our body isn't stupid. Our body isn't going to convert ALA down to there. It'll keep it in the primary form. It can turn it into all six different forms when and where it needs it for each different specific function in the body. You don't need to convert it down to the bloodstream pre, pre ahead of time, just like you don't need to convert all your dollar bills down into pennies. If you need pennies, well, then, yeah, just take one dollar and convert it down to pennies and use them till they're gone. That's what our body does. It stores ALA in our tissues for up to a year and then converts it in the liver, in the, in the fat tissues or uh, in the brain to DHA when and where it needs it. Actually storing DHA in the brain, in the liver and in fat tissues, up to 50 grams of DHA can be stored in the human body. You know how much our brain needs on a daily basis? Two to three or four milligrams. 50 grams. That's 50,000 milligrams. <laughs> and we need two to four a day. So you have about 22 years worth of DHA stored in your body at any time. 
Do we need to keep replenishing this? Do we need omega-3s in our bloodstream for pro and anti-inflammatory conditions? Sure. Do we need it for brain function? Do we need to be converting a bunch of this ALA down to DHA? Hell no. <laughs> no. But we're only drawing blood and using these studies on blood draws that, oh, vegans have too low of DHA. No. It's because you're eating an animal that's already converted to DHA. It's higher in your bloodstream. Yeah, of course. When you take DHA in its pure form and stick it in the bloodstream, you're going to have higher amounts in the bloodstream. That doesn't mean it should be there. And as a matter of fact, news research has actually showed it shouldn't be there because it upsets the balance of EPA to DHA. But listen to my Clean Machine Live video, and I'll talk about more on that too as well. If you guys have any other questions about does a vegan diet, is it too low in this or not enough of this or something that is keeping you afraid of uh, switching over to a plant diet, diet, please put it in the questions, put it in the, uh, the box down below and I will blow it up for you. <laughs> and I'll show you the actual research and the studies to back it up. I'm not just talking off the top of my head. I cite all the research and the studies in all of my different videos. Check them out. I've got tons of them on, on carnitine and choline, on vitamin K, on creatine, and why it's important for muscle building. So questions are, which supplements do I take? So I take ahi flour for omega-3. It's the richest source of omega-3 and omega-6 of any plant on the planet. Clinically proven in published human study for 100% more effective than flax at converting to EPA in the bloodstream. Real important in even in blood cells. So even in the actual cells, higher amounts of EPA, higher amounts of SDA than chia, hemp, or flax. Um, just down the line, it's a, just a better omega-3. And why I would never take an algae supplement uh, for omega-3, because these are preformed EPA and DHA, just like you would find in an animal product. And that's the wrong thing to be doing to the body. Uh, I take a vitamin D3. Obviously, I make one. I, I went out and I found the best source of a vegan vitamin D3 from, and the very first one from organic algae. So it's organic. It is pure D3. There is no other byproducts in there, no D2 in there that could interfere with the vitamin D3. Real important to do that. Lichen and mushroom vitamin D3, although they're vegans, that was all I had to use for a while, but now I found something better that is 100% pure D3 in its colocalciferal form, the same exact form that the body uses for its functioning. I do take an iodine supplement. I use Mary Ruth's nascent iodine drops. Nascent iodine is pure iodine and it's in the drops, the liquid drops, just one drop under the tongue each day should keep you in a nice iodine balance. I do take a magnesium because I work out so often. Magnesium is important for uh, muscle relaxation, helps me sleep at night. I take it before bed. I do take uh, my other supplements for fitness, like clean, clean, clean green protein, because of the high amount of nutrition, the B12, the fiber, the lutein, the chlorophyll amount is one of the richest sources of chlorophyll out there. The vitamin K is off the charts. I mean, it's just an amazing superfood. I have a smoothie every morning with lots of uh, berries and fruit. I take BCAAs because it does mean that I can consume less protein and I want to keep my protein moderate. So I do about anywhere from uh, 60 to 120 grams of protein per day, depending on my types of workout, how intense my workouts are. I customize my protein intake to fit my work. Will work for food, right? If you're not working hard, you don't need uh, accelerated uh, amounts of nutrition. So feed the work that you do. Uh, if you work out really intensely and really hardly, you're going to need more micro and macronutrients. It's just the way the body works. There's no denying that. I take cell block 80 for my hormone health and to keep a healthy prostate. Check out my, uh, my CM Live on uh, hormone health uh, as well as on cell block 80. I take intense prior to my pre-workout. It's getting me gains like I've never experienced before and strength. And uh, overall, I'm hitting my maximum lifts at 60 years of age. I'm hitting my personal records. And I've been lifting since my 20s. 
uh, it's just amazing to, to, to experience that, to experience that level of health and fitness level at my age. And I do take creatine. Um, I take creatine monohydrate. Crea Pure is one of the cleanest that I've seen out there. So if you look for look for one that's vegan, that is uh, creatine monohydrate, not not those funky forms that are not researched or studied, and uh, it's uh, relatively inexpensive that way. But Crea Pure, even though it's a little bit more expensive, has some really nice research out of vegan being really tested 99.99% something uh, pure. So that would be the one that I would use personally. And if I ever put out a product, a creatine product, that's the uh, raw material I would use. Um, so I hope this was helpful for you. Um, uh, definitely uh, asked about sarcopenia and um, getting weaker with age, uh, BCAs are tremendous in that. BCAs are one of the few clinically proven things that can help not only slow, but even reverse sarcopenia, that and making sure you're increasing your protein with age. Most of the studies have shown that um, uh, for reasons not quite clearly established yet in the published research, but as you age, especially for men, you're gonna need more pro higher protein intake. And if you're concerned about higher protein intake, uh, causing health issues. This, there's a great study on IGF-1 that shows that those over 65 actually do not have any of the health concerns when they increase their protein intake. So safer as we age, and as we age, we'll need a little bit more protein as we get older. Uh, that increase in protein, I have some theories on that, but I'll withhold it until the research uh, really kind of verifies my hypothesis. Thanks for listening again. I hope you enjoyed some good takeaways on why plants are better, why there is nothing to worry about for you consuming a plant-based diet, staying physically fit and healthy, 37 years vegan, 60 years in my 60th year of life, love and life, and I want that for you too. That's why I share this information. So you feel empowered and strong and healthy and go out there and make a difference in your life making a difference in the environment, your health, and the animal health, as well as being around and not being sick and dying for those who love you. Enjoy. Have a great day.